But we will go on to our next witness. Uh, Natasha Kroll is an associate professor at the University of Westminster. She's associated with the Center for the Study of Democracy. Her research and publications covered themes relating to democracy, political economy, identity, and feminist and, coast, uh, and post-colonial uh, critiques. And uh, we will now hear from uh, Ms. Kroll. Uh, yeah, or Natasha. say Dr. Kroll? Uh, yeah, Kroll, actually. Uh, thank you so much. I um, Let me just start the timer because I have to fill, uh, fill this house in on... Apologies. Fill this house in on a thousand years in five minutes. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, but let me begin by saying good afternoon to everyone here, Chair Showman and everyone else. Um, I want to begin by saying that I'm mindful of the ironies of speaking here in non-communal terms, being someone who's a Kashmiri Pandit herself by birth, um, but also being someone who's from Kashmir, grew up in India, lives in England, uh, and is speaking in the US today. So there are multiple colonial transitions there that are important. And I think that um, because my written statement is already with you, uh, I will focus on some of those points. But let me just respond to a few things by start, starting to say, by start, uh, starting out by saying that the parallels with, uh, with Nazi Germany and with the Holocaust are actually very apt because the RSS in India, and about whom concerns were raised in the morning as well, is a nationwide paramilitary that is the ideological parent of the current ruling party. And the RSS has avowedly an idea of turning India into a Hindu nation. It also has this idea of an undivided India where everything, everything else in the region will become a part of a Hindu India. Please also remember that the New York Times in 1922 had profiled Hitler saying that Mr. Hitler's anti-Semitism is neither as, uh, neither as violent nor as genuine as it sounds. So things take time to unfold and the proto-fascist trajectory that sadly the, the secular democracy of India is on is very worrying for us all. Let me also say that Shujat Bukhari, I have been to Kashmir every year, you know, uh, 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, including this year during the elections when the whole place was deserted. Uh, and, and Shujaat Bukhari on that visit in at the end of 2016 was the person who had launched my novel. I also write fiction in Kashmir. There is a video of that on YouTube. And he had spoken about the value and worth of what I'm saying. So I do not represent here Indian interests or Pakistani interests. And in fact, that is precisely the problem that the people who speak about Kashmiri self-interest and the rights of Kashmiris themselves are the ones who are most vulnerable uh, from any and every side. The communal politics serves no one. It does not serve the Indians. And Kashmir, if Kashmir were a communal issue, then, then Muslims in India would feel the same as Kashmiri Muslims, and they do not. So it is not a communal issue. It is, albeit, a, an issue that has been communalized. I also want to say that every other day for Kashmiris is a commemoration of a massacre. And when Indians, and this is really not personally against Indians or Pakistanis, but when Indians expect a uh, an acknowledgement of a massacre like the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, where, you know, where under General Dyer, fire was opened on unarmed protesters. What about all of the Kashmiri protesters? What we are asking here is really very, very simple. We're asking for human rights, for substantive democracy, and for the question of freedom, that people who have been fired upon for just gathering non-violently over the years in numerous massacres that I have listed in my statement, there should be an acknowledgement from the state to say, we are sorry. Nothing can move on until there is an acknowledgement of all of the human rights violations that have gone on for these people who have been an important site of early Buddhism, who have seen Hindu rulers, who have seen Mughal rulers, Afghan rulers, and, and then who have been sold for the equivalent of something like 150,000 US dollars uh, in 1846 by the Treaty of, uh, by clauses of the Treaty of Lahore and Amritsar without their consent, and who have then had an unrepresentative ruler who's, uh, you know, throughout the 19th century, it's a story of absolute tragedy. And when we come into the 20th century, I mean, Kashmir is one of the first interstate disputes that the UN was prominently involved in. And there are several resolutions in those early years that the UN was actually trying under various people to demilitarize under Norton, under Dixon, under Menzies. This is a long and complex history, but that complexity should not blind us to the very, should not 
uh, obviate from us, obfuscate from us the very simple fact that there is a political problem here which is compounded by human rights violations and the international community has a role because this has not just uh, implications for Kashmiris who are currently under siege and under collective punishment being deprived of their very basic rights, but it also has regional and potentially global implications because people travel across borders and ideas when they are suffocated have an, and dissent when it is suffocated becomes the, uh, you know, the hardest to handle. So I want to say, um, I also want to look at the time because can, can someone just tell me how many minutes, seconds do I have? I do have time. Okay. Uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I do want to. Uh, yeah, I want to take my five minutes for sure. The the question here is really not so much about Article 370. The fundamental question here is about the consent of the people. If something is being carried out, <laughs> if my time, my time, my time. If something is being carried out for people's welfare for their development, then why does it need tens of thousands of troops being brought in? Why does it have to happen overnight without absolute any absolutely any consultation of the people with placing even the pro-India politicians in prison and then depriving the population of the right to say anything? If it is for their good, then why won't anyone of them be allowed to say something about it? This is an egregious human rights violation. It goes against consent, goes against fundamental principles of dissent as they relate to democracy. And as people who are being claimed in the name of a democracy, as rights-bearing individuals, this is something that they fundamentally should be uh, you know, allowed to, um, to do. This is Thank arbitrary you. use Thank of power you. with no accountability. Thank you. No, I appreciate it, and I, I believe you have something to contribute. Yes, to. yes, I'm actually dying to say something. So, uh, so we recently, me and uh, Atharzia, another Kashmiri, we compiled the first ever volume on women in Kashmir, entirely written by Kashmiri women scholars themselves. And the 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 realities of it are astoundingly uh, worrying. You know, there's there's the Kunan Poshpura mass rapes. There's various instances of sexual violence, the competing patriarchies of militarization and militancy that women women have to face, but Kashmir is not backward when it comes to women's rights. In fact, compared to India, it, is, it has always been more progressive. In 1944, the new Kashmir manifesto, this, this is important, this is important for the world to know. In 1944, the new Kashmir manifesto actually specifically had a whole section on gender rights, which if you read today sounds progressive and is. So Kashmiri women have always had their rights. In fact, much of what has been going on, this is a very colonial move on the part of the nation states around it of claiming as, lib as, as if they are liberating Kashmiri women, as if they are mere territory. And in the aftermath, in the aftermath of the revocation of Article 370, BJP I leaders have, said, apologize, we are going to now marry my, fair Kashmiri women. Uh, the first thing somebody wants, before they want human rights, they want to live. I've, Once I've you heard live that rationale, but it still doesn't explain the lack of transparency to me. Ms. Call, could you, could you address that? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. There's no justification whatsoever for what they're doing, and they know that, which is why it is important not to, for them not to let people speak. In fact, elderly women in Srinagar who were protesting in, in Kashmir Valley were, were released on, were detained, arrested, released on the condition that they sign bonds saying that they won't speak to the media. This is just two days ago. So it is, it is fundamentally not about violent actors. It is about knowing that what is being carried out is politically and constitutionally not right, and it doesn't have the support of people. Let Secondly, me just stop, I'm sorry, let me stop you before my time runs out, because I just want to say as an observation here, and I wish we had more time to, for all of you to weigh in, that to me, when there isn't transparency, something is being hidden. And this is what really concerns absolutely. me terribly. The Indian government has justified the repeal of uh, Section uh, 370, et cetera, Article 370, as somehow a major step forward for women's rights, but they've then told me that this then relates to what if a Muslim Kashmiri woman married a non-Muslim man? I don't know how, and then property rights. Uh, Ms. Call, is the is is Article Three is, is the repeal of that somehow a step forward for women's rights? It's absolutely not. 
although it is claimed that it is somehow going to enhance LGBTQ rights and women's rights, as if those people whose rights it would enhance are not Kashmiris as well. Moreover, on both of these cases, in the, in the case of the LGBTQ rights as well as in women's rights, there are already prior judgments of the courts, I've got this here, that uh, the Jammu and Kashmir High Court in October 2002 in a case on state and others versus Dr. Sushila Sahani struck down the proviso of the fact that the state subject with permanent residency law according to which women marrying outsiders would lose their permanent status. So this was already removed in 2002. And it is a red herring to say that this is somehow going to, uh, to help women's rights. Like with all of the other things, these are just, just instruments used to justify that, I'm you know, that emancipation and liberation I, I, narrative. I, I, yeah. And Dr. Cole, you have the distinction of being both a scholar of democracy and feminism, as well as being the first Kashmiri woman ever to have a no novel published in English. Would you wait in on this uh, particular yeah, issue of feminism yes, and women's Yes, I want rights? to speak as a politics and IR person in, with, with that hat on. So I just want to say that you're absolutely right. This, uh, you know, when we express concern about enforced disappearances in other parts of the world, that is precisely why we should care. Parvina Ahangar, who's the chairperson of the Association of Parents of Disappeared People, whose son was a victim of that, and she's been leading that struggle for 20 plus years. On International Day of Disappeared this year, they were not even allowed to gather and mourn, something that they've done on the 10th of every month and at the end of August. So this is an elderly woman, you know, who has led this campaign, who's been nominated for the Nobel Prize. People, activists, peaceful people even are not allowed that space. So everyone is being pushed towards this, um, you know, this kind of, um, and, and as Angana pointed out, I do want to say that the Hindutva ideology, the political use of Hinduism, religion is neither a necessary nor a sufficient condition for violence. No religion is. So this is not about Hinduism. It's about the political use of Hinduism that is being made to convert India into a Hindu nation where after the revocation of Article 370, in, uh, BJP leaders have said we want to go to Kashmir and marry fair women now and that's 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 literally like that's the level at which this whole thing is that it's this exotic other and the reason that all of this continues you know the question of territorial integrity it's really not simple it's yeah, yeah the British did what they did but we're in the world now and as the statement says outside your archives the past is a prologue the future is the story that we have to write right now it's not a simple question of territorial integrity because our Article 370 had met, according to which Kashmir had its own constitution, its own flag, and its control over uh, defense, telecommun except for defense, telecommunication, and external affairs, Kashmir was autonomous. That autonomy has been literally taken away. Uh, you know, overnight, and so, and that was the article that was was keeping that political dispute in some sort of a frozen zone. Now that's gone, and you know what we are fearing is the worst to come. All right. On Tuesday of last week, over a dozen women were arrested for holding a sit-in in Srinagar against the ending of the state's special status, and media reports indicate that they were released on Thursday after posting personal bonds. The police chief in Srinagar reportedly responded that no further protests can take place, and so I direct this to um, Dr. Call. What are the implications of this crackdown on protests in Srinagar, and do you expect that peaceful protests will continue? Um, it is very hard, and it's uh, you know for people to register how they feel. The two key words here are consent and descent, dissent. Yeah. Right? The consent of the people has not been taken into account; is not being allowed to be expressed, uh, and dissent against what has been done is not allowed either in India too. So in India, there are several activists, and this is why this is not about all Indians. There are numerous Indian activists who have been speaking up against what's happening and what India is doing in Kashmir. And they also have been targeted for saying those things, especially women activists who have tried to say that. So if anyone dissents, they are labeled as anti-national. So you know the point here, and this is, I'm not making this up. This has been going on over the years, as you know as well. Well, and as you indicated earlier. So the thing here with America, which has this, you know, this, this important history, is to recognize that at this present moment, democracy and human rights are under threat globally. It is not the unique preserve of America. I must say that all anti-colonial struggles throughout history have been carried out in the name of human rights. So we must acknowledge the capacity of people, including in Asia, 
to be able to know and speak for rights. And that is what they are doing. But when they are crushed like that, it is our duty as the, you know, as people who realize that these projects, these political projects are feeding off each other. And that is why it's important for American foreign policy to also realize that what's happening is going to destabilize, increase violence, and radicalized violence in Kashmir is not a problem for radicalized actors, including statist actors in India. And that is going to be a disaster because there is a large minority population of Muslims in India. And the fact that people keep referring to Kashmir Valley and the Muslim majority region as being the only problem, you know, that there is a reason why Genocide Watch put this on an alert, because the winter is coming and Thanks. throughout all of, all of, these are real concerns is all I want to say. And I want to be able to say that, you know, as democracies. Thank you. The, the, the time Thank of the you. gentlelady has uh, more Thank than expired. So the uh, Thank you so ever uh, patient, Gentleman from Arizona is recognized. First of all, thank you, uh, 